morning, church. Take out your Bibles and turn to uh, uh, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. If you're visiting with us here today, we email out the notes of the sermon, so please nudge the person that invited you out or the person that is next to you that is a member of the church, and they will send you the lesson as we are going to be jumping through passages today. We are a Bible church, so we believe in the fact that the Bible should speak, not us, but the Bible alone. And uh, if you're visiting as well, we are going through a series uh, where we are studying out different characters of the Bible, learning from their faith or lack of, so that we know how we can gear ourselves up for this spiritual battle in our relationship with God. Amen? Amen. So today we're going to be talking about a special individual, and his name is Barak. And the title of our lesson is, Time to Stop Sitting on the Fence. Time to stop sitting on the fence. Nice. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 to 19. The Bible says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea writes, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, I do not need a thing. But, do not, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and self to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Pretty heavy uh, scripture, isn't it? But you got to ask yourself this morning, are you sitting on the fence spiritually? Some of you guys are here and you've come from churches that are just so used to sitting on the fence spiritually. Where if the music doesn't move your heart, you won't sing for God. Where if the talk doesn't talk about blessing you back with your giving, you won't give to God in that contribution bag. And it's been something that as church and religion, we've kind of allowed people to do so. And yet we understand it's not the same when it comes to any other area of your life. Do I get an amen? Amen. And we, what we see in this passage here is that the Christians in the church in Laodicea, they were well off financially. Life was going well from a worldly point of view. They did not really have any many needs. However, Jesus looks at them and goes, man, you guys are totally far off from where you think you are. You know, the thing about being lukewarm is, number one, Jesus says it's disgusting, right? Where you want to vomit it out. Um, it's funny. Some people have used the analogy of, have, of like drinking lukewarm milk. Uh, does anyone like lukewarm milk? I felt convicted because I personally don't mind lukewarm milk. I was like, dang, man. It's like, does that say something about me? Or you know what I mean? Uh, I know someone was like, ah, oh, it's disgusting. I'm like, I kind of drink lukewarm milk all the time, you know? But um, apparently, you know, it's something disgusting. You just want to, you know, or maybe when you eat something that's gone off, and you're just like, ah, let me just spit it out. And God here has become disgusted, or in other words, he's become shameful of the Christianity that these guys were living out. And the second thing about being lukewarm is that you don't know that you're lukewarm. You know, you can be very defensive about it. It's like, okay, well, when was the last time you brought someone to church? Oh, well, I've been sharing, all right? Oh, well, I've been doing this. You know, last night we went and watched the Warriors, Zabin, up the world. It was awesome. We had a lot of people come out, and uh, whether we lost or not, we still loved the Warriors, amen? Um, but it was interesting because I have a convic conviction that rugby is a game they play in heaven. <laughs> you know why? Because if you're a football fan, who's a football fan in this house? No. All right, okay. See, the thing with football is certain people score goals, not everyone does, right? Other people defend. But what I realized with Christianity, Christianity is not just a defensive sport, it's an offensive sport. 
right? Where anyone in whatever shape or size that they're in can't score a point. Yes. If you're not fast, you run over people, <laughs> right? If you are, you run around people. And if you're neither, well, use your head, you know? You gotta sneak on over, whatever you can do. <laughs> um, and, uh, with, you know, I'd like to argue that, you know, with football, you can't really do that, right? Like, you have the strikers and they're the ones that win. And I thought about that last night as we were watching the game, right? You, you might, now you kind of understand what goes on in my head when I'm watching these things. <laughs> I'm like, man, it doesn't matter how good the Warriors can defend or how good they can attack. If they're not good at one or the other, they're going to lose. And so sadly, that's what happened last night. <laughs> but I think sometimes as disciples, especially when you're lukewarm, you become very defensive about things. Yeah, oh, well, I, you know, I've been sharing my faith. Oh, well, I give a lot already. Oh, well, I, you know, and, and you, you, you're not really focused on what it really takes to go, man, I just want to be all in, hot for God. And so here it says, God that, you know, God here then rebukes them. And he goes, man, because I love you, I need to rebuke you. So because I love you guys, I'm going to rebuke you today. Yeah. Not really. Well, we're going to be kind and gentle about it, right? Uh, but guys, understand this. Sitting on the fence can only get you one thing, and that is splinters. Right? Sitting on the fence, when you think about it, sitting on the fence in the real life for a long period of time will actually damage you. Right? And when you eventually fall off or get pushed off, you will inevitably break something or lose something in the fall. It's the same thing principally wise, um, spiritually. And what you gotta understand is, unless you really throw yourself over the fence, the thing people misunderstand is they, they go, okay, I'm gonna just sit on the fence and be okay with where I'm at. I'm not gonna fully jump and become a Christian, or I'm not gonna fully jump and be like wicked and be like the pagans, but I'm gonna just sit here because it's gonna be okay. You gotta understand, whether you sit on the fence or not, you're still gonna hurt yourself. But it's better to hurt yourself sooner than hurting yourself later. Because the pain can be worse. You know, um, I heard of a good quote that says, uh, it doesn't matter which side of the fence you get off on sometimes. What matters most is getting off. You cannot make progress without making decisions. What decisions do you need to make today about your walk with God? You know, I even uh, found this really cool uh, quote. Uh, in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, uh, they quote this following text, which they pretty much say summarizes how the Nazis were able to overpower so many and kill millions of people. And the quote goes like this. First, they came for the socialists. And I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. And I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. And I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me. And there was no one left to speak for me. You see, that's the reality of sitting on the fence and watching life happens. Soon enough, you not making a decision is going to end up in the destruction of the people around you, but the destruction of your very own self. You know, Edmund Burke once said, the only thing necessary for triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. You know, sad to say that uh, recently we lost a brother, um, but in reality, I had a conversation with him, and I've been getting with him every single day in the past couple of days. And in reality, he had been coming to church for two years, and he had just been sitting on the fence every single day, every single week. You know, I, I'd even ask him, like, hey, bro, do you have anyone coming to church? Oh, yeah, 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 well, well I've been calling, you know, and it's just this defensive mechanisms, like, do you have been sharing? Oh, yeah, I've been following up, yeah. I was like, bro, you're not getting the point. Did you bring anyone? Now, don't get me wrong, if you don't bring someone to church, it's not about the fact that you haven't, it's about, are you going on the offense going, how do I do this? How can I get, help me so then I can bring someone to church? But that was just something small. And in reality, he had been sitting you know, on the fence for a very long time until his heart got really worn out and just gone, I need to get out of this. I just can't do this anymore. Where are you at spiritually today? You know, in contrast, 
We have someone that doesn't want to sit on the fence and has come to get baptized, and that's Tiago this morning. But it's interesting, uh, Chris will share more about Tiago, but you know, ever since I started sitting in the Bible studies with Tiago, he's just like, yeah, sweet, yeah, 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 baptize me now. Chris is like, so when do you want to get baptized? You know, and you know when you're asking a question, you're like, I got him, I got him. And then, uh, and then uh, you know, when, when a person answers and you don't get that answer you expect, and he goes, well, I'm ready. If you want to baptize me now, we can go now. And Chris and I were like looking at him going, wait, we still got a couple of studies. He's like, yeah, but I'm ready. Just let me know. I'm waiting on you guys. And so he's going to get baptized right after the leaders meeting today. But see, it's interesting because he had to look through the studies and he goes, man, I, I don't want to just sit in the fence anymore. Amen. I want to do something with my life. I want to save a soul and I want to make disciples of all nations. Wow. You know, in Judges chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, today we're going to be studying out the life and the times of Barak in Judges 4 and 5 to gain some in, uh, insight into being wholehearted or being half-hearted. In Judges chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, the Bible says, after Ehud died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, a king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth, Hagoyim, because he had 900 iron tar- chariots and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. They cried to the Lord for help. You know, we get a running start here, and what's happening is that Israel had now been under uh, oppression for 20 years, and it happened when they didn't have strong leadership. You see, when people don't have strong leaders or strong people in their lives, when you're left to your own devices, you, it will become unspiritual and destructive in your own life. You know, even as we're studying the Bible with uh, Jared and uh, uh, Tiago, and uh, we talked about in a, in a church uh, study about how, you know, your different parts of the body, right? And uh, very often what they say is like, yeah, Chris is, Chris is pushy, you know, but it's good. And then we talked about the different parts of the body. It's like, hey, you might be an ear. I do know one thing for sure that Chris is the bicep of the church, you know? <laughs> so you feel some force because he's a bicep, right? <laughs> I might be maybe the heart or whatever, you know. Yeah. <laughs> trying to make myself look good, you know? And then I thought Pascal was the head, but I was like, oh, wait, that's wrong. You know, Jesus is the head. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Kelly, you know? We'll, we'll find a place to fit you in the body, you know? Um, but you know, uh, you, we need strong leadership. Without strong leadership, it'll lead to our own demise. You know, how much do you value the leadership in your life or your disciple? You know, do you, are you eager to be led do you look for solutions on how you can be hot for God? How you can be better? How can you can be on the offense rather than being on the defense? You know, the only time during the period of Judges, when you study out the book of Judges, when Israel's enemies came from within their land was when they didn't obey God and they didn't have strong leadership and they didn't obey the leadership that God put in their lives. Yet sadly, Israel was so hard-hearted that it took them 20 years of oppression to finally cry out for the Lord. You know, they sat on the fence of lukewarmness and radical action for 20 years, comfortably numb to the reality of their wretched spiritual state. Now, you got to ask yourself, do you need to soften your heart in prayer today? How long will it take for you to go, man, I just need to work on my heart? You know, and even uh, the brother I was sharing about, I got with him yesterday and I just really tried to help us out. I was like, look, even if you're going to leave, I need to talk to you as a friend and I need to deal with your heart because if you don't deal with it, you're going to destroy the other relationships you're going to go to in the world. That's love as a disciple. I knew I was already losing, but I was just like, it doesn't matter. This friendship isn't about you joining the church. This friendship is about helping you deal with your heart and your character because you need to be heart for God. Do, any, do we have any hot disciples in the house? You know, funny story. Uh, I remember um, one guy came up in, in our church in Samoa. One of the brothers came up and did a welcome and did this passage. And he goes, are there any hot disciples in the house? Yeah. And then he goes, are there any lukewarm disciples? And then one brother goes, yeah. Wait, wait, I think I'm wrong, you know. But maybe that's where you're at today, where you're like, oh, I think I'm fired up. But then you got to look at your life and go, man, does it look fired up? Point number one. Great spiritual victories take great planning and effort. Yeah. 
We'll start it from Judges 4. We'll start from verse 4 and it will break along the way, but we'll finish in verse 24. The Bible says, Deborah, prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. So here is a woman that is now leading the people of Israelites. In a time where there were no strong men, women had to step up and lead. You know, I remember having a conversation with um, um, Precious not too long ago. And she said, man, the, the women's ministry is fire. I don't want to lift up the women's ministry. They're doing awesome. But it was a very wise insight, she said. She said, I was very joyful about it. But then I thought, actually, if the women's ministry are fire and the men are not, there's no point of us being fired up. He goes, I believe there's an attack that Satan is putting on the men today. And then the women feel like they have to lead because there are no men. Um, and then the women get fired up and go, look, we're making things and whatnot. He goes, and she goes, I really had to set my heart to go, man, I need to encourage my brothers. Yeah. I need to raise them up to be godly men through my encouragement because yeah. it doesn't matter if I get fired up. If the men aren't fired up, they're the ones that lead. And so Satan would want to try to diminish them a bit so then they won't lead us in general and so even if the women get fired up it's going to come crashing down at some point but dang that's that's a two month old disciple right there but see guys there is an attack of Satan on the men of New Zealand there really is I mean, you have men that don't know how to deal with their emotions and then go and make a TikTok video about how they don't like you and then, you know, and they persecute you. <laughs> and then you have the women that just look at you and go, I don't care what he says. You know, it doesn't matter what her, his opinion is. This is my opinion. I'm going to come to church and I'm going to get baptized. <laughs> but we may look at that and go, oh, men are, no, men are not better than women. Neither are women better than men. Guys, there is an attack on men here in New Zealand. Come on. And if you don't have the conviction to step out and be a man to lead, eventually Satan's plan of having women lead will be successful. And so we continue on. It says, She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kedesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Sebulun, and lead the way to Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army. So Jabin is the enemy. And with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Very well, Deborah said, I will go with you. But because of the way you are going about this, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to the Kadesh, where he summoned Zebulun and Naphtali. Ten thousand men followed him. And Deborah also went with him. You know, right here we're introduced to this guy Barak. His name actually means lightning, right? And he was the great hero of the day. Sadly, however, we see that this guy was sitting on the fence, watching the pain of his people and not acting as he should. However, one thing I do want to, you know, commend him for was the fact that when he was called to do what he needed to do, he had lightning repentance. You know, do you need a challenge to do something great? I think sometimes the best challenges can come from sisters. I know for me, the best challenges challenge that I've ever received from a sister was from my wife. Um, so before I, I had an interest in her, I remember I was sharing my faith. Now, I like to be joyful and happy about sharing my faith. And, you know, there was a time where I then shared my faith with men and with women. Jenna pulled me to the side and goes, hey, are you okay? I was like, yeah. It's like, yeah, like, whenever you share with women, it's like, it's almost like you're flirting with them. <laughs> from that day, I never shared with a single woman anymore. <laughs> I was just like, oh my goodness. But there was that lightning, it was like, I don't want to be doing that to women. I don't want to be deceiving. And so ever since then, I made a rule. I'm never ever going to invite any other women in my life. Obviously, unless they're, you know, a colleague or something like that. I don't want to be legalistic. But you know, where is your hat at today? Do you need to have a day of lightning repentance? A day where you just need to draw a line in the sand and, and declare, look, today is the last day 
that I'm going to be who I am and stop being a radical disciple, giving my life to Jesus. You know, are you the hero that needs to come out of the shadows? You know, one thing that Barak also did well was he had a plan, right? We continue on. It says, now Heba, the Kenites, had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Sananim near Kadesh. When he told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, um, had gone to Mount Tabor, Sisera gathered together his 900 iron chariots and all the men with him, from Harasheth Hagoyim to the Kishon River. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go! This is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down to Mount Tabor, followed by 10,000 men. At Barak, sorry, Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword, and Sisera abandoned his chariot and fled on foot. But Barak pursued the uh, chariots and army as far as Harosheth Hagoyim. All the troops of Sisera fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Sisera, however, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heba the Kenite, because they were friendly relations between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the clan of Heba the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she put a covering over him. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone here? Say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent pig and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the pig through the temple, through his temple, meaning through his head, into the ground, and he died. Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you are looking for. So he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with a tent pig through his temple, dead. On that day, God subdued Jab Jabin, the Canaanite king, before the Israelites. And the hand of the Israelites grew stronger and stronger against Jabin and the Canaanite king until they destroyed him. What an, what an awesome passage. You know, right here, we see that Barak's tactical management of the battle turned a possible defeat into a glorious victory. The Bible says here, this guy, Jabin, um, and Sisera had these 900 chariots that would have destroyed uh, easily Barak. And Barak had 10,000 men, right? So 900 chariots, that's, you know, you could probably take out 10 or 20 men with one chariot. And so you can imagine just how much more this battle would have been. But it's crazy because we see here, he, cl he cleverly selected the battlefield so that he can win. So he, it, the Bible says he comes from Mount Tabor, meaning that he had descended from the mountain, whereas for the enemy, they had to go up the mountain. And so for the chariots, it would have been hard for them to go up the mountain. And then on top of that as well, right before the mountain was a valley who would have been muddy. There still would have been some water around there. And so it would have been tough for the chariots to actually go past it. And so he knew this is the plan. We are going to do it and let's go for it. You know, Barak selected a rainy day for battle as seen in his song in Judges chapter 5, verse 20 to 21. It says, from the heavens, the stars fought. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. The river Kishon swept them away. The age-old river, the river Kishon. So he did this, and then after that, the Bible says he goes and chases them for about a good 30 kilometers all the way until they kill them. That's like going from the CBD to Papakura, right? It's a 30-minute drive at 100 kilometers per hour. So these guys were real men. Sadly, they were men that were on the fence, but kudos to them, they made a decision to get off it. But you see, it took great planning to get a great victory. You know, we always say, if you plan for nothing, you get nothing. If you aim for nothing, you get nothing. nothing. And so planning is incredibly important. You know, sometimes I think we need to stop using modesty as an excuse for action. You know, I think for here in uh, New Zealand, we often use this word chill, right? I'm a chilled guy. <laughs> Guys, chilled people have chilled faith. And you know when your faith is chilled? It ain't good. It can harden your heart. You need to be crazy. Yeah. You need to be radical. You need to go, man, I'm so in love with God, I will do anything, go anywhere, and give up everything. 
You know, but Barak was a modest man and he did not, did not look to lead. You know, you could say that he was going with the flow. Doesn't that sound like New Zealand men today? <laughs> you know, too many disciples use modesty as an excuse for inaction. They go, well, I can't really put myself forward. Like, who am I to put myself forward and go, I can lead? The Bible says you were called and you were called by God. Full stop. John 15, 16, it says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so, and so that whatever you ask for in my name, the Father will give you. You know, Barak's modesty or sober assessment of how few victories he had previously in his life made him humble and used disadvantage to listen to the people around him and get the victory that he needed. You know, uh, even last night uh, as we were out in the, the Waz game, it was awesome. Uh, it was raining. It was cold. But it made me think of, uh, of one of the, the superstar players for Rugby League. So if you follow Rugby League, there's this guy they call uh, Joseph Manu, right? I think only Ian knows him. Does anyone know him? See, you, you guys don't follow rugby, you know? Up the walls. Anyway. Um, but this guy, you know, he's from Hamilton, born in Hamilton. He went to Tokoroa High School. I don't know if we have any Tokoroa High School friends uh, or people here. Um, but it's very interesting. His story went like this. So in high school, he played a lot of sports, but he didn't really play rugby league. And uh, one day, the, the, the recruiters or the scouts from different NRL clubs came into a school uh, that he didn't really go to as well that they came to watch this one guy they call uh, uh, Roger Tuivasa Sheik. Some of you guys may know about him. And because, you know, news of him had spread throughout the country, it's like, man, this is the next prodigy, like, he's good, like, this guy's great. And so they come and they come to watch him, and then one of the guys in his team, this guy that was really good, uh, Roger, um, got injured. And so they were looking around, like, who can replace him? And this guy, Joseph, just rocks up, and he's got his boots, and he's, like, not even coming to play, he's just coming to watch. And then uh, his dad looks at him and goes, hey, Joe, some, they're looking for someone. It's like, can you go play? And he goes, well, yeah, well, I can play, but I don't play center because center was a the position they needed. He goes, yeah, just go. And he goes, okay, sweet, sweet. Puts on his shoes, puts on a jersey, runs on, gets recruited, and now he's one of the best players ever in the competition. <laughs> But see, if he had sat there and gone modest, it's like, oh, no, no, this, this is not my team, this yeah. is not my school. I was like, oh, no, no, like, I don't want to take the spotlight from the guy that they came to recruit. You know, you're just like, give it to me, I want to go. He has a crack, and they recruit him, and now he's playing for the Sydney Roosters. And he's also got a contract now in Japan, because he's that good, they pay him about a million a year. Wow. You see, so much of what you fear as the reasons why you won't throw your heart out there right. could be the very thing that could lead to God's miracles in your life. You know, it's often said that the cave that we often fear to enter is often the cave that holds the treasure. Wow. You know, victory comes through humility, great planning, and decisive action. You know, where are you trying to have a victory in? Or you need a change in? Or repentance in? You know, is it in your finances? How's your finances going? In your health and fitness. It's been six months, guys. Some of us have not lost a kg, or even worse, we've gained an extra kg. I think it's fair. From the snacks we ate last night, we probably gained some kgs right there. Bearing fruits. Right? How's that going? Are you sitting on the fence with your family? Where you're bold with everyone else, but not with your family? It's like, oh, well, I don't really know if they're, they're Christians or not. You know, are you sitting on the fence of your love life? You know, I appreciate um, um, Sarah, who's now in our church in Sydney. Um, but I remember, you know, after her first failed relationship, she had a lot of fears. And she's like, got insecure, you know, being modest. She's like, oh, I don't know, you know, maybe it's too much. And then one day I'm like, Sarah, what the heck are you doing? Get your phone out. Look up this guy named Diogo Adam. <laughs> Funny enough, um, I think he responded in about 20 minutes later, which is actually quite quick, you know? So, man. And it's like, 
And so she's like, what do I do? Should I wait for him to text? I was like, no, you text him. Yeah. She got on her phone, texted him. Hey, Diago, I'm a sister from here in Oakland. Just wanted to say hi. How's your relationship with God? I was like, yeah, make it a little fluffy. They got into contact. He came here, was infatuated by her, went over there, and now she's dating for two weeks once again. But you guys saw her story last night, right? It's like, ooh la la, you know, my boyfriend can cook, ooh. I was like, it goes there. You know, some of us, we need to stop being modest. Sometimes modesty is the word we use to actually disguise our pride. That's what insecurity is, it's pride. Yeah, I've been going around, going to the sister, so who are you interested in? So who are you interested in? Hmm? 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 One sister came up to me, please don't do this. Like, no, I'm gonna keep doing it. You wanna find some comfort? You find it from the mom of the church. I'm gonna keep pushing you until you start dating. Right? Um, where are you sitting at in your studies, your career? Are you sitting on the fence? You know, can you already see the victory because it's so well planned out can you already see the light at the end of the tunnel? You know, I'll close it off here and I'll have uh, Chris come and preach and close us off. But, um, you know, there's a story, uh, some of you guys may have heard about it. Um, it was a giant ship and the engine failed. And so, uh, you know, the owners of the ship, because it was expensive, they figured, okay, it might be cheaper just to fix the ship rather than getting a new one. So they've been looking, they look around, they try to find a mechanic, bring in one mechanic after another. They look at the engine, they they couldn't figure out what's wrong with it. They bring in another mechanic, they bring in another mechanic. They bring the smartest mechanic that just graduated out of Harvard. Comes in, doesn't figure it out. And then they bring this really old guy that has been a mechanic since um, he was young. And so he comes, he takes a look, he then goes for a tour around the ship. He looks, he studies the ship, he studies the engine, top to bottom, he goes around and then he gets to the engine and he starts looking around, starts sniffing a bit, you know? And he's got this massive toolbox with him. He takes out his hammer, he starts putting his ear to the, to the engine and then he kind of feels his way around and he brings out his hammer and he just gives it a light, gentle tap. Boom. And he goes, turn on the engine. They turned it on and it ran smoothly, like it was new. (laughs) And they were like, how did that guy do it? So anyways, you know, the old man just puts his hammer back in the toolbox and then he leaves. Then he sends them an invoice. An invoice, and the the amount of the invoice was $10,000. The owners look at themselves and go, what the heck? He he barely did anything. Uh, what, What is this? And then they email him back and go, hey, can you give us a real uh, specified, um, what's it called? Invoice um, telling us of how you broke down the price. And so he broke it down and the invoice went like this. He said, tapping with a hammer, $2. Knowing where to tap, (laughs) $9,998. You see, effort is important and so it should. But experience and knowing where to direct that effort through planning means a lot more. So my challenge is this. What, what things do you want to achieve in your life? This week, I want you to sit down with a person that mentors you and go, hey, how can I achieve this? What is God calling on this? And what do you think and how can I achieve it? Would you guys want to do that? Yeah. Get with your mentor, get advice, and to God be all the glory. Yeah, okay, point number two, Judges chapter five. So, blessed are the wholehearted, and cursed are the heart or no hearted. You know, in the victory song of Deborah, we see the heart of all the players in this story exposed. It's all exposed. It's all out there. Judges chapter 5, from verse 1. On that day, Deborah and Barak's son of Abinim sang a song when the princes in Israel took the lead. When you have Keen coming up here to song lead, I feel like there's a prince, yeah. When you have Kevo come up here to song lead, you're like, there's a nice prince. When you have Sia come up, oh, he's the mafia kind of prince. <laughs> when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. Verse nine, the heart is with Israel's princes. With the willing, volunteers among the people praise the Lord 
verse 15 to 17. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Yes, Issachar with Barak rushing after him into, into the valley. In the, de- in the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Why did you stay among the campfires to hear the whistling for the flocks? In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Galid stayed beyond the Jordan. And then, why did he linger by the, by the ships? Asher remained on the coast and stayed in his caves. Verse 26. Cursed is Meraz, said the angel of the Lord. Cursed, cursed its people bitterly because they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. You know, there were 12 tribes of Israel. There were many people in Israel. And yet not all of them came to fight. Some of them stayed behind. Some of them weren't willing to come and help the princes. I feel like it's, it's what, some of those times where we got, every, you got Keen, you got Kevo, you got uh, Sia up here singing. And then you look at everyone here in church, and some of, some of us, we're, we're, we're not singing at all. And some of us are even just moving our lips. Have you ever seen that one guy? What song are you singing, bro? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what song you're singing. We're singing Praise Jesus. You're like, I don't know, a wimbo, a wimbo. Come on, bro. Sing the right song. Are you that person not singing? Is there anything coming out your mouth? Or are you just moving your lips? Yeah, we are all called into battle. The whole church is called into battle. We got little Tamika. Sorry, I call her Tamika because she's my black and me sister. We got little Tamika over here. She's fighting for her life. She's out there sharing her faith. So everyone here should actually be expected to be in the battle. Even Yvonne. She recently cut her hair, and it's awesome. I think it's because she uses the ends of it to now whip people into the church. <laughs> but should we expect to see Fata at sharing? Yes. Should we expect to see Sada sharing her faith on the battlefield? Yes. Yeah, there's actually only one reason why you shouldn't be in battle. Right here in Deuteronomy chapter 24, there's a Bible study, so if you're quick, get there. It says in verse 5, if a man has recently married, gotten married, he must not be sent to war or have any other duties laid on him. That's awesome. <laughs> For one year, he is to be free and stay home and bring happiness to his wife. Yeah, do we have any marriage in the house? Yeah. Yeah, do we have any recently married in the house? No. Yeah. Have you been married for a year? No, no one here has been married for less than a year. So guys, everyone, for less than a year. Oh yeah! So only these two should not be in a battle right now. But, you know, it is, it is a battle we should all be in. But to be honest, marriage in itself is a battle, guys. Some of you guys want to get married. Some of you guys want to start dating. But, bat- you know, being married is a battle. Ask Murat. You know, the, the 12 disciples were challenged to, to be forgiving 77 times, Jesus says. I don't think they met Marari. She has to forgive me 77 times a day. Not in her whole lifetime, a day. Do you know how many times I stick my foot in my mouth? Tons. Oh my gosh. And then there's kids. Oh, having kids, guys, is difficult, man. We had to convince Chris that yogurt is ice cream so he'll start eating something healthy. In the morning, I think our neighbors think we're crazy or terrible parents. We're like, Chris, do you want some ice cream for breakfast? Here's some ice cream. Even at Bible talk, Chris has been chopped up on lots of chocolate. He somehow snuck the chocolate away from Zay. Should have been Zay looking after him. But he sucked the chocolate away, and then after, like, Chris, do you want some ice cream? And everyone's like, what? You're giving him ice cream after chocolate? No, no, guys, it's just yogurt. <laughs> Yo, know, being married is a battle in itself. But if we're not out there every day sharing our faith, not getting out of our selfishness, we ain't even ready for marriage, guys. Put that goal down. Start having a goal to pull yourself out into sharing your faith with others. Have you overcome 
your selfishness and being on the battlefield? How do you overcome and start to gain your victory? You know, God gave these guys a great victory. He gave them an awesome victory. And it was incredible. God only needs a few willing people. Yes. Only a few. Just a few willing people who are ready to do anything. Ready to take on anything. Ready to do anything. He needs a little remnant. If no one in your Bible talk is stepping up, are you stepping up? If no one in your Bible talk is bringing out visitors, are you bringing out visitors? If you think your leader is a little silly or a little crazy, you come to my Bible talk, you'll see a little something crazy. Uh, we got lots of arguing, we got lots of murder in my Bible talk. I can be the craziest person. But if you think your leader's not stepping up, then you help them step up. Yeah. Bring out someone to study the Bible and let your leader start doing, start studying the Bible with them. I love the women in my Bible talk. You guys are absolutely amazing. We got Zay, we got Bernaki, we got Edith, and we got my beautiful wife over there, Marani. I just want to give them a round of applause, guys. And then I'll tell you why. Now I'll tell you why. So Mara stays at home and looks after Chris in the evening. It's not easy looking after Chris, as I've already said. He is very difficult. I, I make this joke in Bible studies. We don't believe in baby baptism, but I think Chris has come to a point where he started to be aware of his sin. <laughs> Honestly, I, I think Chris is a conscious sinner. I say, Chris, don't do that. He's like, I know what I'm going to do, Daddy. <laughs> There was this one time he kept smacking the TV. I said, Chris, don't smack the TV. He's like, okay, uh, okay. and start smacking the TV. I'm like, Chris. <laughs> Everyone here knows what Pow Pow is. I was like, Chris, come here, Pow Pow. He's like, please, no, Daddy, I want to smack TV. He says it, guys. Listen to him. I want to smack the TV. So I'm like, oh, okay, so cute. My heart is sunk. Okay, Chris, you know, I will give you Pow Pow. You're free. He's like, yeah, I got away with that. And then he looks at the TV, sees a program he doesn't like to watch, runs at it, and smacks it with both hands. Both hands. And he looks at me and falls to the ground. No, no pop out, please. No pop out. He knows it. So I took him into the next room and I gave him a really good pop out. <laughs> Only when you're a parent, you can be proud of those pop outs. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but being a parent is hard. You know, those that do not come and spend their time sharing their faith, it's, it's, it's really hard. It becomes a challenge for you to simply be obedient. Mm -hmm. You aren't obeying the call of God. Okay. Maybe you have these questions when it comes to going out into battle that make you want to not go out to battle. Is it the right time? Is it the right time to share your faith? Is it the right time to reach out to this brother who you're interested in? Is it the right time to take this sister out on a date who you're interested in? It's definitely not the right time to start trying to date without advice. <laughs> We will all be victories if simply we go out of our way and start trying to do what we feel is the impossible. You know, I'm too busy with family or pre-planned pre work commitments. An example, uh, and a common excuse I hear, uh, sorry, one of the excuses is I'm too busy with pre-planned work uh, commitments. Another ex uh, excuse we often hear, I heard this one from Zay. Uh, I was in my fields. Oh. <laughs> I don't want to share my faith. I was in my fields. <laughs> my fields. But the cool thing about Zay is she's repented from yeah. those fields. Another excuse we could often have is very simple. It's a very simple one. Doesn't take much thought. You've probably done it yourself. I'm sorry. That's it. Have you ever heard someone just say, I'm sorry? They're not even trying to come up with a lie. <laughs> You're too lazy to come up with a simple lie. I would rather, honestly, I would rather someone lie to my face than simply say, I'm sorry, and continue to do the same thing. <laughs> just repent. Oh. Yo, it reminds me of another, of another verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 16. For the eyes of the Lord ranges through the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on, you will be at war. Your know, God is looking for all those people who are fully committed to him. Not just simply committed to him, but fully committed, 100% in everything they do. What's the difference? Well, Jesus says this, no one who puts their hands to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Someone who is fully committed to God has left everything behind. Mm -hmm. Everything they've ever held on to. Everything they've ever desired. Everything has ever, anything that has brought value to their life before becoming a Christian. They also put down and see the world around them as less than their relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Are you all in? 
Are you ready to give up everything? Have you already given up everything? When God finds this person, He gives them strength. He gives them the strength to do anything. He gives them the strength to get the job they want, to change their health and fitness, and to repent. Yo, I love Jared. If you, get, if you don't know Jared, Jared's been coming out. He's studying the Bible. He says he's ready to repent, and he's going after it. So encourage him when you see him. But the cool thing about Jared is that he now whistles kingdom songs. He now, I, I ignore it. I don't want him to, to see that I'm noticing. But Mira came up to me the other day, and he, she was like, did you hear Jared at Bible talk? I was like, yeah, baby, I heard him. He was whistling kingdom songs. I was like, yeah, baby, I heard him. <laughs> he, he's just sitting there singing and whistling. Yeah, babe, I heard him. He's, he's, he's happy. He's changing. And God has given him strength. Uh-huh. And then you got Bonsu. <laughs> Bonsu is an incredible guy. Yeah. And I, one thing I love about Bonsu is I challenged him to stop slamming my front door. <laughs> <laughs> He's too strong. Yeah. Yeah. And so God helps him repent in being less strong in slamming my front door. <laughs> now when Bonsu walks through the door, you can't even hear him. He's like a little ninja. <laughs> if you seek repentance, God gives it to you. Yeah. And then you got Tiago who's come to get baptized! <laughs> I love Tiago. He is amazing. You go through those Bible studies, he's like, yes, yes, yes. I'll share my faith. I'll go out there and share my faith right now. You got to repent from this sin, bro. Okay, yeah, I'll repent. You ask him about it a month later, he's not done it again. He changes. And I asked him about it again the other day. He's like, yeah, it's weird. It's like God has given me, I don't know, I, 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 it's weird that I'm not sinning anymore. I used, to, I used to sin every single day. Now, I can't remember the last time I sinned. What strength has God given you? You know, questions that you can also ask as to whether or not you are fully committed. Are you setting up Bible studies with your visitors? Are you bringing people out to church? Bringing people out to church is one thing, but are you going after pouring yourself completely into their lives? Yeah. I feel like sometimes we can bring out a visitor and it's like ticking a box. Yeah, I brought someone out. And then you completely ignore them. They're like sitting at the back of the room. You're at the front of the room with a seat free right next to you. You don't want to bring them over to you. Yeah. What's going on? you got to be willing to pour yourself out to them. Again, I love Bonsu in this area. Mm-hmm. Bonsu used to bring out visitors to, to Bible talk, and then you would like just stare at them and smile at me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I brought that guy, guys. I brought him. That's my guy. Yeah. Where's he from, Bonsu? I, I don't know. <laughs> he looks Filipino. Do you at least want to guess? Uh, you ask me, Chris. <laughs> But now Bonsu sets up Bible studies. Come on, Bonsu. Now Bonsu goes out and prays with people. Now Bonsu is a different man and he's still single, amen. Oh, <laughs> when was the last time you led a Bible study? When was the last time you sat down opposite someone and taught them what it meant to seek God? Okay, it's a, ch- a, a question for the members of the church. Who here has at least led a church study? Other than Scotty and Jenna and Mira, who here has led a church study? Okay, we got Alejandro. We got one. Who here has led light and darkness? Yo, you, you gotta be in your Bible. You gotta be ready to teach people these studies. Scotty and Jenna aren't gonna be with us forever. It says here in Hebrews chapter 5, and I love the scripture, but from verse 11. We have much to say about these things, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, during this time, you ought to be teachers. But you need someone to teach you the elementary truths. Are you eager to pass on your convictions or are you waiting for someone to give you the convictions to pass on? Are you eager to get into those Bible studies and teach someone the scriptures? When was the last time you raised your regular contribution? I regret um, praying or saying anything in front of Scotty. I was in a Bible study with Jared and we are doing a contribution. I said it in front of my wife and I stopped myself halfway to shut myself up. I was talking about our contribution. And it got to a point where our contribution just goes and I don't even notice money missing from my bank account. Uh, it gets to a point where I'm like, okay, man, we've given our contribution. Uh, I didn't even notice it. Let's still spend some money here and here and here. And I was praying and I shut myself up before my, before my wife and then I put my foot in my mouth in front of Scotty and he preached it to the church. <laughs> my contribution is no longer a challenge for me anymore. I give contribution and it's not something where I'm like, oh, I really want to give it. And it's not a matter of the heart, I'm just happy giving. It's because I actually have a pretty good, comfortable pay, uh, pay slip now. Mm-hmm. Are you in the same situation? 
Now that I've said it in front of the church, I kind of have to up my contribution. <laughs> now that I've said it and you've agreed, you've got to up your contribution also. Yeah. Do you grumble or complain about the commitments at church? About going to Bible talk? Jared loves this story that I like to tell people. I was talking to this one brother about how I was, we were at Bible talk and he was like, dude, I'm so tired. It was a long day. And I was like, dude, I'm tired. My son's still awake. I still have to be a parent and a Bible talk leader and a husband and a friend. And now I have to comfort you? Come on, dude. <laughs> And then this one person calls up, I'm not going to say who it is, they know who it is. And he's like, hey, I'm not coming to Bible talk. Uh, and he's talking to this other brother, and he's like, hey, Jared, Jared, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Jared. <laughs> hey, Chris, Jared said, he's talking, Jared said he's too tired to come to Bible talk. I'm like, dude, I just said I'm too tired to be at Bible talk. It's at my house. You're too tired. <laughs> Tell Jared to come to Bible talk. He gets back on the phone. Hey, Jared, Chris is tired. I'm tired. Everyone's tired. You are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Is your weekly schedule filled with God? Are you holding on to the teachings of God? Are you truly going after it? I was talking to one brother, and he said, oh, I, I don't feel free. I don't feel like I, I, I'm ready to do, do anything for God. And I love the scripture. My wife uh, shared it. She was in the bedroom. She was rebuking someone. She's studying the Bible with. My wife is awesome, guys. She's got my and she comes out of the bedroom, and I t she asks, oh, hey, how's, how's this guy going? And I, share, I tell her what's going on. And she's like, oh, I just rebuked the sister with this one scripture nicely. And, and basically, <laughs> if you're holding on to the teachings of God, you'll be set free, as the scripture says. But remember, all, when you are set free, you feel set free. Yes. You feel at peace. You feel like you can give up everything. Right. Do you feel at peace making God the priority in your schedule? It's so one thing to do it. It's another thing to have your heart behind it. Practicals for getting off the fence. Get open. Talk about it. Openness will hold you back, guys. Honestly, openness will hold you back. If you don't get open, it's like, it's, it's honestly just holding on to something. Holding on to something that's pulling you down and just waiting for the devil to come and whisk you away. Choose somewhere to jump into. If you feel like you're a good singer, if you feel like you can sing, jump into song leading. If you feel like you want to be a Bible talk leader, Chiago's waiting to become a Bible talk leader. He, he's, he's, he's like, Chris, give, give me an opportunity to lead Bible talk. Nice. Next minute, he'll be the one murdering everyone. <laughs> we play a game. We, it's called uh, Werewolves. And so we like to go around murdering people in Werewolves. Uh, me and uh, Bonsu always win. <laughs> but if you feel like you want to be a Bible talk leader, be a Bible talk leader. Bye. If you feel like there's someone you like, share it with your disciple. Say, hey, I like that brother. <laughs> hey, I like Murari. All of you guys know, when are you going to be open about yours? I'm married to her, you guys all know. Get a schedule, get accountability. Pursue the victory until you get the victory you want. Pursue it until you get it. In conclusion, time to stop sitting on the fence. Point number one, great spiritual victories great, take great planning. Speak to your disciple. get open about what's going on in your life. And then do, do you have a plan? Do you have a plan for your quiet times? Every Thursday, Kelly and I pray from 4 a.m. to 5 a.m. And it's also a time where we get to confess our sins. Amen. Do you have a plan for your ministry? Eden is awesome. Eden was the one who shared our faith with Tiago. Yeah. Eden was the one who shared our faith with Tiago. Yeah. Mirari is awesome. She also shared her faith with Jared. Mirai was sitting at home, playing game, playing dinosaur with Chris and getting attacked because this kid likes to throw blocks for some reason. <laughs> and she was sharing her faith on Meetup. She was like, oh, here's this guy called Jared. Doing. Oh, hey, would you like to come to church? Doing. Oh, yeah, I would. Okay, here's. Oh, doing. Chris, stop it. That's Mirai's life. <laughs> we even have Nia at church today. Nia over there, she was shared by Funaki off Meetup. Yeah. And, la and Friday night, we had a professional female bodybuilder come to Bible talk. 
Someone went out and shared with her. Yeah, you can think it's Zay too, but we had a professional. Point number two, blessed are the wholehearted and cursed are the half or no hearted. Do you feel cursed? It's probably because your heart's not fully in. Are you cursed? Again, check your heart and see if your heart is fully in. With that, to God, you have a glory.